Okay, so well, I will just start and slowly. So yes, for, for those who remember a bit what we did last uh, Friday, we, we discussed a bit the uh, hyperon interactions and how to construct them, hyperon nucleon and hyperon hyperon interactions. So if you remember, hyperons are strange baryons. And I, I told you that uh, you might study them in different scenarios. So you might study them in, um, in, in Earth experiments on hypernuclei. Actually, uh, I didn't discuss much about hypernuclei, but this I will do on, on Thursday. Well, I didn't discuss anything, so I will do it on Thursday. And today I decided uh, to, to start with neutron stars so that you see where to study and why it's so important to have a control on these interactions in order to understand these, um, these uh, compact objects, these neutron stars. So yeah, so basically uh, on Thursday, uh, I will show you the different mo uh, a model of the ones that I will mention here. So then you see how things are built, you know, in order to understand how hyperons interact with other one with others in 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 neutron stars. So I will then show you an example of a of a way of of calculating those things. But today is just about neutron stars and a bit of overview. So the outline of 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 the of the lecture is first of all, of course, is to introduce neutron stars. So maybe half of you or even more people know about what a neutron star is, but I will give you some some ideas. And then uh, I will concentrate on a couple of, um, of observations, let's say a, a couple things that you people have been observing and that are connected actually later on with, with what is in the interior, which is masses, radius, and also uh, what they are called gravitational wave events coming from the mergers of two, of the, the merger of two neutron stars. And of course, in order to understand all of this micro -physi macro physics, we, we need the, the micro, okay? So we need to, to relate it to what is in the neutron stars. And this is when these uh, um, points arise. So you, I will discuss a bit what is the, the core, what we think we have inside the, the core of a neutron stars. And uh, I will concentrate on two possible scenarios. So basically, nucleonic matter, so only nucleons in the core. And then I will move to introduce hyperons and the strangeness degree of freedom. And finally, to see you know, how we relate this macrophysics with the micro uh, through what it is solving uh, for the calculation of the masses and radius. And this is done through so to looking at the structure equations for neutron stars. And then finally, the, the example of mass and radius. So uh, what a neutron star is, you know, in, in a few words, when we refer to neutron stars is objects, stellar objects, which are very compact. Compact means that the ratio mass between um, volume or radius is indicating you that general relativity effects will be important. So basically we are meaning objects very dense. So for a neutron star, we are talking about masses of one or two solar masses, but then radius of the order of what, 10 to 12 kilometers. So if you, well, this is a typical picture you can find in internet, just to show you, you know, what 10 kilometers mean, if you cannot, you know, imagine, as compared, for example, here to the size of, of um, you know, the Manhattan. And of course, as compared, you know, for example, to the black hole, you know, so basically, is the most compact objects, oops, if you don't consider black holes, okay? So if you do this mass and radius, you know, mass divided by volume, uh, you will find that we are talking about uh, densities, uh, mass densities of the order of five to 10, uh, which in, um, in units of what is called saturation, uh, nuclear saturation density. The nuclear saturation density is the average density inside a nucleus. So it is correlated, I, I think I mentioned on Friday, you know, the average distance between nu to nucleons is around one to two Fermi. So if you translate this into part particle density, uh, it means a value maybe fa familiar for some of you, which is 0 0.16, 
0 0.17 Fermi to the minus three. And if you translate it into grams and centimeter cubic, of course, you're talking now about mass density. We're talking about three times to 10 to 14 grams per centimeter cubic. Okay, so we are talking five to 10 times. We don't know exactly, but uh, pretty dense objects. So uh, what else, you know, why is interesting from some of us uh, working on that field? Well, the interest is lies on the, which you can test, as I said, matter under extreme density conditions. So from different disciplines, you can find uh, an, a different interest. For example, astronomers, you know, you, they observe things, they like to you know, observe the sky. And then they are very, you, it's very interesting because they want you know, these small stars that are visible in different energy ranges going from radio to X-rays and gamma rays. So this is, you know, an interesting object that, uh, that astronomers, you know, are, are studying. From the point of view of particle physics, physics you know, is in the evolution of these objects is uh, in what is called the cooling of these objects after they are formed. I will mention a bit how they are formed. Uh, it's interesting because they have all these reactions involving neutrinos. So, uh, it's an interesting place to analyze, you know, all these neutrino emissions so emission, uh, as a neutrino uh, source. And it's also interesting from the point of view, you know, of having quark matter. So basically deconfined matter. So this also a place, you know, where you can uh, make an hypothesis of that you have quark matter and then see how this uh, relates with the macro physics that you are observing. From the point of view of nuclear physicists, you know, it's like a big nucleus, the largest nucleus that we can have. And definitely it's a place interesting, you know, to study its composition. It's what is called the equation of state that I will mention also today. And also for cosmologists, because they are not black holes, but, you know, it's the densest objects before, or, uh, you know, they are black holes and then uh, neutron stars come. And from the point of, com of, of uh, computational physics, then it's very interesting place really to how to simulate their birth and, and the evolution, which is sometimes, a, well, most of the time is a real headache because of all the variables in order to have a really good simulation on how it evolves and how it, and what is the composition. So when it was discovered, so you can imagine uh, that we are talking actually on the uh, be beginning of the 20th century, because we uh, basically they were predicted to be observed in supernova explosions. I will mention what it means supernova. And uh, actually they were discovered not to, uh, not, not later, I mean, the neutron, um, for example, was discovered beginning of the century. So not longer after those um, objects were, were discovered, okay? And well, first predicted and then discovered. So uh, actually the concert, the, as it's written here, the observations remain inconclusive until the 1967, where actually one graduate student, Jocelyn Bell, probably you have heard of her, was doing, um, was a grad student in astronomy uh, and was taking data uh, in the radio telescope at Cambridge University and then found out some kind of, of, of source that it was emitting in, a, in pulses in a regular manner. And after you know eliminating all possible or removing all possible sources, man-made you know, on earth, then he, he realized that this actually was coming from space. And actually this made them think, you know, that it was kind of a discovery of some alien life. But uh, of course, later it was realized that it was actually coming from a neutron star, which was rapidly spinning. So how a neutron star is formed? Uh, well, this is really a complicated story and people working on this field, they really take, you know, a lot of complicated and simulations and there's a lot of physics and a lot of different reactions being involved. So I'm going to give you a few words, I mean, a very brief idea. So basically you start with a very large star, which is running out of fuel, of nuclear fuel. So basically you have kind of a, you know, layer um, star where you have, you know, because of fusion, 
you are ending up, you know, inside the core with different layers of different uh, nuclei. So moving from the lightest one of helium up to iron. And this star is um, in, let's say, in, in marginally stable be because of the electron pressure. So basically electrons are the ones sustaining the star. So you, you can imagine a heavy star of what, up to 10 solar masses. And, and then you, you can imagine the electrons, you know, competing against this collapse, the collapse of, uh, due to gravity. But this is, is, as I said, marginally stable because you, you have having process, you know, that involve electron capture uh, and, and therefore this stability is, is lost at some point and also dissociation uh, mechanisms, nuclear mechanisms in such a way that at, uh, once this uh, core reaches what is called the Chandrasekhar ma mass, which is uh, 1.4 solar masses, uh, the idea is that the electrons cannot sustain the star anymore, okay? And therefore, the, the, it goes under collapse. So there are different, you know, stages in this collapse. So moving from this massive star, which starts, you know, collapsing. And then because of this collapse, uh, the, you can imagine all this matter infalling inside the star. So the matter, uh, going towards the core becomes more and more, you know, uh, compressed. And at some point, because of the of the Fermi um, prince, I mean, of the of the repulsion of uh, between nucleons and the uh, and the Fermi uh, degeneracy, this becomes uncompressible. And at some point, it bounces back. So basically, you imagine also something piling up, and then suddenly, you know, it cannot take it anymore and just bounce back. And this is the reason this is why this star collapses because there is a, an out outward propagating shock front that, uh, you know, uh, there are different stages in the sense that it gets at some point stalled because of the different uh, velocities between the infalling matter and how the speed of sound, you know, um, so it, it decreases as we go uh, outward, so they create some kind of, you know, um, infalling um, discontinuity in such a way that the shock st uh, waves stalls. But you know, by different mechanisms, this um, that involve neutrinos, this is reinvigorated, and at the end of the day, this star explodes. Okay, so I'm just giving you in five minutes a very complicated process that people really are trying to simulate and uh, with different processes that are not so well known, okay? But just to imagine that, you know, heavy star collapses and on the way of exploding, uh, it leaves uh, the origin of a neutron star, which is a proton neutron star, which is something which is hot and it with the time will uh, cool down to, up to a neutron star. So, what do we know about neutron stars? So we know a few things. We have, there are observations, as I mentioned, of course, on binary on binary pulsars, on isolated neutron stars, on glitches, on quasi-periodic oscillations. And out of this, we can have get information on, for example, masses, as I said, one to two solar masses. That is uh, one of the best known measurements is the Hulse Taylor pulsar, which actually lead to the to a Nobel Prize to Hals and Taylor because it meant that this measurement, it meant uh, that uh, or discovery, you know, opening a venue for testing general relativity. Then we also, you know, and this is something now that is very important or really being, uh, um, you know, study in very detail is the radius of those objects, which is something that up to very recently, they were not reliable determinations, okay? And uh, we had an idea, but not exactly, okay? So, and then as I said before, the densities are pretty high as you compare, for example, with the density of the universe or the density, you know, uh, on earth, we are talking a few grams per centimeter cubic. It's also a place where you have strong magnetic fields, strong magnetic fields that, you know, Pre range depending on what kind of neutron star you're talking. And uh, so we are having, you know, neutron stars, they are called magnetars, which have very strong magnetic fields of 10 to the 16 Gauss in the sen 
you know, that we don't know actually in the center, but is around, you know, what is uh, thought. And, and then we have temperatures that depending on this evolution from the supernova explosion, they are talking about temperatures, you know, between six to 10 kelvins, 11 kelvins. So actually this is something which, you know, for us is if we think, uh, you know, 10, 11 kelvins, you would think this is something really hot, but actually it's not the case if we compare with the Fermi energy of those objects, because we are talking about that 10 to 10 Kelvin is one MeV, okay? And we are talking about, you know, energy, Fermi energies of the order of 300 MeV. So this is for us something which is cold, okay? And you will see if you analyze, study uh, neutron stars, or you have ever looked at any of these papers, these are called cold objects, okay? So basically, if you, if you, it's uh, in the MeV scale is something which is cold, okay? They have, of course, the rotation. I mean, this is how it was observed. They, they, they rotate actually when in their formation, I mean, they, they end up rotating and they keep on rotating between milliseconds and seconds. There are observations in, in this range. So for example, I mean, I said that the pulsars, you know, they were observed as a form of pulsar. So these are rotating neutron stars, which, you know, the radiation, um, the, let's say the focus beam of electromagnetic radiation is written here is, is oriented along uh, the magnetic axis. So basically you, you have a misalignment between the magnetic axis and the rotating uh, axis, the spin axis. And this is why it gives you, you know, this lighthouse effect. And this is how we observe these, these pulses. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of them discovered since 1967 maybe in 3000 right now. And uh, as I said, you can be detected in different wavelengths. So moving from radio to more energetic um, uh, radiation like gamma rays. The, uh, so what are the, the, the observations of, of these objects that are most interesting for me actually for this lecture? It is, I'm talking about masses, I'm talking about radios, basically, because this is something which is very connected with what is in the interior and you can have an idea of what mass to expect from this object depending on what you have in the interior, okay? So as for the masses, here you see like a, a bunch of, 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 of objects in binary systems, okay? And uh, actually, as I said before, one of the best determined ones is this house Taylor pulsar, which is here in this double binary neutron star. And actually, why in a few words, okay, I'm not showing it much detail, but it it gave, you know, this Nobel Prize to House and Taylor because it tested um, the prediction of general relativity on in what sense. So usually they are what they are called five Keplerian parameters that can be determined uh, from the, in these binary systems, okay? It is, uh, I'm talking about the periastrum, which is the closest point in the elliptic um, orbit. I'm talking about the orbit, uh, the time, the um, orbital period. I'm talking about the projection of the, of the uh, axis uh, of, into the, uh, the semi-major axis into the light of the observer. I'm talking about, uh, I'm missing one, um, the eccentricity, okay, of the orbit. And it turns out that if those objects, you know, are so compact, there are also some other five, but they are called post-Keplerian parameters that depend on these five, uh, which are related to general relativity effects as Shapiro delay time and shape of this, as uh, decay of this orbital period, because general relativity, you know, shows you that this, there is a decay, uh, decay of the uh, periastrum. And those are correlated to these five um, um, Keplerian parameters and the two masses. So basically the idea is that if you uh, observe, uh, are able to determine two of them, you will determine the two masses of the object. But if you determine a third one, uh, since you only have 
as a variable that you don't know are the masses, then you have a set of, uh, you have a extra information that is corroborating this um, relation between this post-Keplerian and Keplerian parameters. So in some sense, it's like having a, a set of equations that's over-determined, okay? So therefore, if you determine and you and you find what general relativity is predicting, then you are having a test of it, okay? And this is the case that happened with this house Taylor pulsar. For us, lately, this mass is not so important because actually, as I will show you, all of the models give you this 1.4, or at least if you have to believe in any model giving you this 1.4 solar mass, all of them should reproduce that. But there is an issue with objects which have larger masses. Larger masses mean masses of around two solar masses. And, rec and recently, mm, I mean, now is not so recent, the first measurement, or, uh, let's say of the 2010, but there are these measurements that have very small error bars, okay? And then uh, are showing us that it's possible to have objects of two solar masses. And as I will show you, indicate you with some plots, uh, some of the models that you know try to understand what's in the interior do not reach this two solar mass observation. Okay, so then it's kind of a the first step, let's say, you know, from observation point of view, to try to um, let's say um, distinguish between possible scenarios and not so feasible as scenarios inside the neutral star, okay? This is not the whole story, of course, but you know, there are these observations and therefore all models that you have for the star, for what is in the interior, at least have to find, to get these, these two solar mass observations. At the end, I will tell you how to relate, as I said, this macro measurement, this observation with the microphysics, okay? So observation, so here, this table, actually, I took it from uh, a paper of the 2015, where you could see several anal analyses in different kinds of uh, neutron stars. So you have rotation power, radio millisecond pulsars, bursting neutron stars, or quiescent, quiescent thermal emission from accreting neutron stars. So different uh, uh, neutron stars in different conditions uh, being analyzed in order to extract the radius of these objects. The, this was done through the spectra or the X-ray spectra from the atmosphere, okay? So it's kind of indirect me uh, measurement, not, but indirect, uh, uh, yeah, well, analysis, observation of what is the radius of this object. But this spectra is very dependent on how is the composition of the atmosphere? What are the magnetic fields? Uh, also, you know, you can imagine these objects are very far so it's also quite, I mean, to determine this small radius out of these objects very far away is also very difficult. So as you can see, the different analysis were giving you a range between eight and 16 kilometers, okay? So, and, you know, it was difficult to really have where are their consistence. So maybe you could think that if you don't uh, consider or maybe just take this lower part of this radius of around 13 kilometers of this analysis, you could think that seem to be favoring radius below 13 kilometers. But this actually was kind of the situation up to very recently. And actually, thanks to all these X-ray telescope emissions that are being launched and sent, in particular to NICER, which was actually two, three years ago, in the sent to the space, um, the um, it's a NASA uh, mission that it was called. This telescope was located in the International Space uh, Station, and recently, you know, they have been giving all these more good, let's say, or analysis of the radius or observations of radius of for different um, for different uh, objects, in particular. We have this one, this uh, PSR uh, with this number with radius, you know, around 13 kilometers for an object of one, around 1.3, 1.4 solar masses. And a second one, which is actually also recent from last year of around 12, 14 kilometers for a mass of two solar masses. So this is actually, uh, uh, 
you know, let's say a breakthrough in this, in this uh, uh, determination of the radius, because we are having measurements of the same object with the same with with a certain mass and now we know the radius okay so this is something really now pushing you know the the at least for people doing modeling inside the interior of neutron stars is something that people really were eager to have and we are now having it okay in the future there are new missions the xtp mission which is a esa chinese uh, mission collaboration and so this, let's say, NICER continues to, uh, analyzing different sources and XTP is coming next, okay? So we are really eager, you know, to, to have new measurements and new determinations of this radius and mass at the same time. But nicely also we have this, you know, recent, recent, you know, 2017 uh, was one of the first one of a binary system of two neutron stars that was collapsing, okay? A merger of two neutron stars that got together, you know, and then um, and then collapsed, and then was an emitter, okay, of these gravitational wave events. And uh, up to now, there has been a, a couple of more, okay? And there's still, of course, debate whether these are two neutron stars or not, but definitely the first one, you know, it was like also, you probably have seen in the news, like a really important moment okay in this uh, for gravitational wave detection okay which so and this is this um, gravitational wave event i mean taken from the original paper of the ligo virgo collaboration or ligo virgo collaboration and here you have what is called the strain so basically is the tension um created uh, because of the passing of this gravitational wave. So they have this interferometer, okay, where you have these light pulses. And then because of this uh, passing through this gravitational wave, this creates between the two arms a different phase, okay? And this is somehow what is shown here, which actually is this evolution in this merger, these two stars getting together, the spiral phase, then getting closer and closer. So the 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 merging phase and then this means the ring down phase okay so basically the the numerical relativity uh, determination is the red one and the other one is the observation okay so it's really imposing one on top of each other so really it's you know again uh, general relativity works here is also actually some diagrams or graphs on the frequency versus the time. So also here is, you know, this evolution here, you see it here in the frequency where finally, you know, uh, merging. And one of the things that can, can be extracted is what is called a, the mass, the a function of the masses of the two objects, which is called the chirp mass, okay? So to have an idea of what the masses of the two objects are, and also what is called the tidal deformability. The tidal deformability, the idea is uh, that you induce, you know, you, you have these almost two spheric objects, and then you induce a quadruple moment on one of them because of the presence of the tidal field of the other one. Okay, as they got closer together, you know, there is a deformation in that object. And this is measured or indicated by this, in, uh, by this coefficient, which is the tidal deformability. And this tidal deformability, uh, well, here are some expressions, but that, this is the dimensionless tidal deformability. This is correlated with the compactness of the object, okay? So in some sense, you know, it gives you information on the mass and the radius of this, uh, these two objects that are um, meeting, okay? And here, you know, also in this paper, you can find this is the tidal deformability of the one of the objects, the second one, and this is the first one, where the first one has the largest mass, and actually here is this different confident levels of where the observation is. And these lines here, these ones here, are different models, okay, for the, for the, what is in the interior, okay? And then this also, you know, helping this tidal deformability to get information, again, as I said, on the mass and the radius. Actually using this information, there has been different works trying to set constraints on the maximum mass, and also on the radius of those objects. Of course, this analysis also take into account some assumptions, and then you have to see how good or bad those assumptions are. 
But as you can see, they have triggered, okay, this event triggered a lot of studies in order to get an information on the radius, which is something that we were lacking, okay? Okay, very good. So let's go to the uh, internal structure and I, maybe I should go faster a bit. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Um, this style and the mobility, um, how is it related to the equation of state? So suppose you have the pressure as a function of the density. Is it enough to extract the information or uh, do you need something more? Well, you need, uh, in order to comp compute these plots, you only need the equation of state. I mean, you because you can get the mass and the radius, okay? And by some mathematical relations, you can get the value of the tidal deformability for each of the objects, okay? So the, the point here is to really calculate the mass of the radius of the objects come using an, a specific equation of state, okay? And then general relativity gives you these all, all, I mean, all these relations, okay? So this is your question, right? On those, yes, yes. On if, those, if, non, if the knowledge of the, of the equation of state was enough to get this number. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we do that actually, okay? So, so yes. Of course, the equation of state, now I'm telling you, is not something, uh, you have different phases, let's say this is my next point, different structure of the neutron star, okay? So the, you have an atmosphere, then you have a crust, and then you have a core. And there are different, um, let's say, um, how do you say different, not faces, but you know, for example, the atmosphere, you know, the, the densities that we find here, you know, tell us that it's made of atoms. While as you go farther and farther in the interior, like the crust, you get more and more, you know, higher densities. And therefore you are moving, you know, from, uh, for example, in the outer crust, a lattice of nuclei and free electrons. But as you go through the inner crust, this is crossing what is called the neutron drip line. So neutrons start dripping out of the nucleus. So now you ha start having neutrons, free neutrons apart from electrons, okay? And then you have more complicated, um, more complicated different uh, structures that you might have in the crust, in the outer crust. And finally, in the outer core, you have these densities that you have an idea what's happening, but it's not so known because densities of above two, three times saturation density is something that we cannot test here, okay? That we don't have information. So therefore there, you have a lot of hypotheses, a lot of different possibilities of the equation of state, okay? Of the interior of the formation. And of course you need, I'm concentrated on that part, but you also need information on what is the other phases in order to determine the tidal deformability. But in any case, the most important contribution comes from this part that we don't know because it's the largest region that we don't know. It's the largest area, okay, of the neutron star. So what are the possibilities we have here? So we can have a thing I show you the first on Friday. We can have the confined matter. You can have mes mesons. You can have pions and kilns. But you can also have hyperons, okay? And this is what I'm going to concentrate on, having hyperons here. Okay, but first I'm going to go to nucleons, okay? So first I'm going, because this is how also always start, you know, uh, neutron stars, the neutron, where it comes, I mean, the already name, no neutron, some nucleonic, okay? Because these were the degrees of freedom that we have at the time. So the idea here is first to think, you know, nucleons. So for the first thing that you might, you know, thing whenever you do these calculations first is like, okay, I have a boson or I have a fermions, okay? This is how you start thinking. Let's assume I have uh, fermions, okay? These, I don't know, these I'm assuming. So the first thing you might think is having a Fermi gas, okay? And actually, uh, this is actually unrealistic in neutron stars for some reasons. First of all, having a Fermi gas of only neutrons, which will be the word of neutron star, okay? So the first thing is that you cannot have only neutrons, okay? Because neutrons decay, okay? Because neutrons have a lifetime. They, the mass is larger than protons and they will decay to protons, electrons and antineutrinos, okay? So the, dif the small difference between neutrons and protons already telling you, you know, this is going to decay. And actually, if we have only neutrons, this will only decay and don't be in a stable uh, situation. But this is actually 
Not true because it contains a small fraction of protons and electrons. So it has to inhibit somehow this decay, okay? So basically you have something in equilibrium, which is not only composed by neutrons, but also by protons and electrons. I mean, in the minimal scenario, okay? In the minimal case that you think you have nucleons in there, you have also protons and electrons. Now, the second thing uh, is um, that the Fermi gas ignores that particles are interacting. The Fermi gas is, for those who doesn't know, they are feeling, you know, the, the difference, they are fermions, so you start filling up the different levels of energy. You know that because of the Pauli principle, they cannot just be two in the same state. So you start filling up, so you start having more and more energy. But the idea is that those uh, uh, fermions do not interact. And actually, it ignores the Fermi gases, as written here, it ignores nuclear interactions. And there are important contributions, okay, to the energy density coming from those interactions. And this is actually seen if you go and do an analysis, okay, a calculation using a Fermi gas of neutrons, not interacting and solving the structure equations of neutron stars, and you don't even get to one solar mass, okay? So actually I think you get to 0 0.7 solar masses. So there's something missing and those are nuclear interactions, okay? And finally, I mean, this is just nucleons, and this I will come later. There are something else. It could be something else. And this is hyperons, because the mass of the hyperon is not so different. Like the lambda is not so different, for example, to the nucleons. Okay. So it might happen that energetically is more favorable to have hyperons than nucleons at some certain densities. Okay. And this is something where, you know, push the idea of having strengthens in neutron stars. So I'm going to start with the two first points, okay? That's to show you, you know, what I'm meaning by that and what the, first of all, what are the conditions? Ah, you have a raised hand, yes? Yeah, uh, I would like to ask you. Yes. If, you, if it's known the, per, the percentage of uh, uh, nucleons uh, or neutrons in uh, neutron stars. Known, each model gives you something, okay? So if you just think, okay, let me rephrase it better. So <clears throat> if you think of a nucleonic model, it will tell you that mainly, I will show you which conditions to have. And then by assuming these conditions, which is called beta stability, you will have like an important fraction of neutrons. So basically those are the dominant ones. And then you will have a small fraction of protons and electrons, okay? So the exact fraction depends on the model you use, okay? But all the models that are only not nucleonic, sorry, <coughs> gives you like between 80 and 90% of nucleons, okay? And the rest are protons and electrons. Sorry about that. <coughs> it's okay? So, <coughs> I, so, what it means having neutrons and protons in neutron stars? So, the conditions that it has to be fulfilled are, they're called <coughs> equilibrium under weak interaction. Let me <coughs> stop for a while, <coughs> get some water. Sorry, now I'm back. <laughs> so <clears throat> the idea is that the, the equilibrium in neutron star is determined by weak interaction. Okay, these are the scales that determine the, the, the equilibrium in neutron star. And actually, which kind of reactions I'm, dis I'm discussing are those involving, if you think about neutrons and protons and electrons, those are beta decay and electron capture. Okay, so the first reaction you might think, you know, there's a decay of neutron. So neutron going to protons, electron, and antineutrino, which is the responsible for the decay of the neutrons, as I said. However, this is halted by the protons and electrons, you know, because we have uh, in the lowest energy levels, you have protons and electrons. They are occupying these Fermi C's. They are being Pauli blocked, what is called. So in this regime, you, are, you only not have neutrons decaying to protons and electrons, but also having the electron capture, 
Okay, protons and electrons go into neutrons and antineutrinos and, and neutrinos electronic. <coughs> Sorry. This equilibrium can be expressed in terms of the chemical potentials. <coughs> so basically, you are having a relation between the chemical potential of the neutron, the proton, and the electron. Why neutrinos don't appear? Because they <coughs> freely escape. Because basically, in this momentum of equilibrium, they are not there anymore. Basically, when the equilibrium is established, the neutrinos lived already. <coughs> so therefore, these reactions are understood in terms of the chemical equilibrium between the done by the chemical potentials. <coughs> the original uh, object is also charge neutral. Therefore, there is also demand that there is neutral, the charge neutrality. So therefore you have the same quantity of charged particles, positive and negative. In this case, you will have protons and electrons. And another thing that is conserved because you have nucleons, you have baryons, and you have this kind of reactions which doesn't break baryon number is that the baryon number is conserved. So these are the conditions when we discuss beta equilibrium <coughs> with neutrons, protons, and electrons. Now, this is <coughs> the conditions that will determine the amount of each of the species that you have. Okay, so you will have a model I will mention later, and <coughs> these conditions will determine the quantities of these particles, okay? Now, <clears throat> nuclear interactions. So as I said, only having a first Fermi gas of neutrons on one hand is not possible because of this uh, neutron decay, but also is not possible because there's something more. There's more energy density and there's more pressure coming from nuclear interactions in order to understand masses, okay? And this is actually, understood in terms of the equation of state, which for those who doesn't know, is just a relation between thermodynamic variables. That means relation between pressure, energy density, pressure of density, you could see in different forms. And here I'm showing you that at zero temperature, so in these cold objects, this is the quantity that our model will give us, okay? In this sense, there is an expansion that can be done in order to correlate you know, uh, this expansion, some of these parameters in the expansion with measurements that we can have in, in, the, in, the, um, in the laboratory, actually. So actually here, what is done is you know, separation between the symmetric part and the asymmetric part, okay? So this part means it's coming when you have the same number of neutrons and protons, while this one is in, in, in giving me the information that actually this is not asymmetric, what, uh, uh, object, and it depends on this uh, on this delta, which actually is the really uh, the difference between neutrons and protons. Okay, as a function of the mass number, which is the sum of the of these two. This uh, symmetric part, okay, it's what is called the equation of state for uh, symmetric nuclear matter, which means with the same number of neutrons and protons. This is an hypothetical, okay, system. And you can actually do also an expansion for low densities, okay? And then you find this second term, which will be the second derivatives, which is related to what is called the compressibility. This is the curvature, okay, of the equation of state. And as you can see, there are only even terms. And this is actually because this expansion is done uh, 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 around the minimum, which is the minimum energy uh, which is maybe you have heard this minus 16 MeVs. If you have ever heard about, you know, the mass formula, you know that there's a volume term, a surface term, a Coulomb term. So the volume term is giving you information, you know, of infinite matter, okay? And this, the coefficient in front is this minus 16. So in an infinite system, okay, is this minimum, okay, which is correlated. Uh, with, and then you do an expansion around it. This, the part which gives you information on this asymmetry is uh, called the symmetry energy, 
This gives you information on how difficult it is to change all neutrons into protons. And here you can also do an expansion in density. And you have different terms, which are, you know, this first derivative, this L term, and then this second one, which is, you know, similar, like the second derivative, like the incompressibility, but in the asymmetry energy, okay? So why I'm showing you all of this, because in some sense, you, you, all the models, at least at low densities, are on saturation, there are some quantities that have to be respected or have to fulfill some observations, okay? What I mean is that not only there are observations, but also there are, uh, oops, I think I jumped here. There are constraints coming from nuclear physics experiments, okay? And those are some things that also your equation of state, which is your model, has to fulfill. And those are the energy per particle, this minus 16 I told you, which is experimentally also seen by measuring different nuclear masses for different um, uh, nuclei. This is the saturation density, the particle saturation density. And uh, this is pretty well known. You can see the error bars. But then as you go you know, to, the, the, to the higher order terms, the compressibility, then there are different experiments also in heavy ions or diamond monopole resonances. Another experimental that is giving you trying to also constrain this 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 coefficient this value, and it's also nothing is not yet really well constrained. Okay, so you can see a range in this curvature. Okay, now if you go, this is these two term these two terms are you know in this expansion at low density of the symmetric part. In the part of this asymmetric part, uh, sorry again. You have that the symmetry energy is also there are several experiments, uh, neutron skin thickness, heavy ions as well, measurement of nuclear masses. So it gives you pretty good, well constrained these values. But as you go to the higher or uh, uh, higher order parameters, you know, in this expansion, there is even less and less constrained. So an example, you know, this is this L parameter, which is the first derivative of this symmetry energy as a function of the symmetry energy. And here there are different measurements, you know, bands, for example, this is coming from what is called an uh, electric dipol depolarizability of certain nuclei. Then here you have neutron skin thickness measurements. And you can see, you know, there is a broadband, okay, of, 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 of results that doesn't help, you know, to constrain what the models, what models are the best, okay, because the points here are different models, okay. So, this is something that uh, also complicate. I mean, complicates. Uh, you know, uh, gives you some freedom, but also it's something that has to be constrained in order to really pin down. You know, the equation of state at lower densities. Okay. Now, uh, regarding oops, regarding astrophysical observations, I told you about masses. Okay, so they are. I show you this table. There are more, of course. I mean, there are this range of masses that can be obtained, that has been observed. Uh, so here is typical. I will mention at the end how you compute this masses versus radius. And uh, these continuous lines are different measurements. This will be the 1.4, okay, measurement of the Hall's Taylor. And now you have here one of the two mass, solar mass observations, okay? And these lines here that you see here are different models, different equations of state are giving you different relations between the mass and the radius, okay? Because this depends basically on the, this, each of these points is a solution for a given model, okay? I will mention later how this is obtained. But of course, we need not only this, if we have so many models in the whole range, but we also need radius. And this is what I was mentioning, you know, of needing a simultaneous mass radius measurement and the need, you know, of all these X telescopes, uh, X ray telescopes. Of course, this is not the whole story. There is cooling observations. How, uh, what's the temperature, uh, the effective temperature of those objects with, with time, okay? And this is kind of what they are called uh, cooling diagrams, where you have the effective temperature of se several observations as a function of the, of the age of the star. And here you have these observations with the error bars. And the models are all these lines here, depending on the cooling processes, on the way that these stars are cooled. And it depends as well on the interior, okay? 
There are other things like moments of inertia that people are also starting being interested in, especially because the, it seems there's going to be measurement soon. And of course now gravitational waves and other oscillatory modes like quasi-periodic oscillation, okay? And if you give me maybe five minutes more and we stop, okay? Just to show you, or even less, just to show you how we approach the problem, okay? I'm not giving you details of any of these models. I'm just telling you that usually in order to construct an equation of state, we have two ways of approaching the problem. Usually they are, you know, generally, you know, what they are called microscopic ab initio models, which basically, basically start with this two body, three body interaction. I mentioned the first lecture, you know, I told you about the hyperon nucleon, hyperon, I told you about nucleon nucleon interaction, then I told you about hyperon nucleon interaction, right? So <clears throat> you start from there and you put on top of it, use some uh, many body treatment in order to include that you don't, you, on, you don't only have these two particles, but you have lots of them, okay? So you have to include your many body framework. And in order to do so, there are different ways of doing it. There are called variational methods in order to you know, minimize some function that takes into account all these particles. Uh, this is famous for people working here, Akmal Pandari Ravenhal equation of state. There is also a way you know, doing Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo simulations, couple cluster expansion, diagrammatic ways, and this is what I'm going to show you on Thursday, a diagrammatic way in order to, to get the equation of state, okay? How to put the many body, what is the many body framework? What, how you built up, you know, your many body, your system with so many particles. There is the relativistic version of that. There is also what they call renormalization group methods. Of course, lattice. I mean, you put the nucleons and in, in this case, nucleons in the lattice, okay? And then try to solve all the possible correlators and things. So it's a hard work, okay? Because we don't have only two particles, we have many. So here there are examples of the equation of state versus the density, particle density, okay? For example, for symmetric nuclear matter or for proton neutron matter for two different approaches. Uh, this is sort of, um, let me say soft um, Green's function, soft core Green function, I think. Uh, no, self-consistent Green function, sorry. This is the Agmar Pandari Pandar Ravenhal. This is the, this diagrammatic, which is called Brugner Hartree Fock, I will mention later. And in particular, you can see here with the same method, okay, which is also the Brugner Hartree Fock, the disparity, okay, in the equation of state as, a, as you increase density, okay? And just looking at this case, which is only two body interactions, you see the disparity. And this is because we don't control this high density regime because this is entering into the problem of two nucleons getting too close to each other, okay? So even in the simplest case and in the simple model, there is a problematic here on which interaction you use as a base, okay? So it's very important to constrain your two body interaction in order to build up your many body framework. So even in the same many body framework, if you have two different interactions and they are not well known as you get the two nucleons closer, so at larger densities, you have this disparity of results. So the nice thing here is the advantage. You can have an addition, a systematic way because there is different ways of really controlling the higher order contributions, but the disadvantage is up to where you can apply this because of the systematic is lost and more difficult diagrams appear and you don't have a control over them, okay? There are, then there's another way with this called phenomenological. So you basically try to make some density dependent interactions that are fitted to some observables and nuclear experiments. And those would be non-relativistic um, density dependent functionals like ONI, SCRM, relativistic mean fields, liquid drop model, statistical models like Thomas Fermi model, sorry, statistical models and Thomas Fermi models. So different ways of approaching this, like creating some functionals, which have some parameters that are fitted to some observation and experiments, and then you have predictions as well. The problem here is, okay, the advantage first, you can apply to high densities. The question is, how systematic the whole thing is because you can start adding, you know, terms and you have not a control of it, which you had previously on the 
on the app initial models. Okay, so I think I I will stop here and um, and, and and any questions. Um, so yeah, so basically I'm not giving you. I will give you only details on Thursday about one specific case, but there is a lot of variety of, of ways of approaching the problem of the equation of state. Okay, I have a question. Yes, please. <clears throat> so maybe it flew over my head. I, I didn't quite understand what you meant by before you could control the number of terms, but now you can't do so. What, what did you mean by what that? I meant? What I meant is, for example, I was thinking this app initial that you, uh, for example, that I'm thinking of diagrammatic, okay, approaches. I'm thinking of a two body. And then uh, as I show you, uh, you can start adding higher order correlations, like in a chiral effective theory matter, okay? I was thinking something like that. You can start adding terms, okay? And then controlling the contribution in the medium of these terms, okay? So you start with the basic, which for example, what I know, you know, this this one of the examples is this Hartree Fock, this Brunner Hartree Fock, and then you can go to the next order. I mean, you can make things more complicated, but somehow you have a systematic way, okay? But now if I refer to these phenomenological models, I mean you create some density in functionals. So you create some density dependent terms. I'm thinking in Gonyi or in Skirm, okay? And then you have some parameters. And the point here is you could start adding more parameters or more density dependent terms in order to have better description, but you don't have any way of controlling, you know, kind of a systematic, see how you add them, why you add this one and not the other one, okay? Uh, so this is, for me, the difference between these two approaches, okay? The way of, of dealing with uh, how you add corrections, okay? How you, and one way, in one case, you have an idea of how to do that, even if it's too complicated sometimes to really do it. But on this phenomenological, you start adding, adding terms. Also, relativistic mean fields, if you have ever worked on that, you start adding terms that you know is going to improve the compressibility or it's going to improve the high density, um, depend, uh, high density part of the equation of state. But why do you add this way and not the other one? Okay, so and another one. So this is where the systematic is lost. I don't know if you follow me. Yes, uh, an appeal to systematicity is important. So thank you. Yeah. Also, I have to say, I mean, you know that it's complicated, but then uh, I mean, you know how to do it maybe in some way, but it's very difficult to do it. So then you have to be in a mid, in a half term. So you, I'm saying, you know, you, in the diagrammatic, you can add them, you know, but it's so complicated that you probably cannot do it properly. Okay. And at the end, you do some assumptions. So you have to be aware, you know, of the limits of your models. That's everything I want to say here. Can I ask a related uh, question? Yeah. Uh, the other way around. Uh, yeah. Which is the problem of Abinizio calculations in the treating high density? The complexity of the diagrams that you have to do. And the, for example, thinking about diagrammatic and also the control you have on the two body interaction or three body. You, you, you have the problem that as you increase the density. You could have four, four body, five body also this kind of. Uh, yeah, many, many body forces. In yes, principle. but even you know, if you have the two body, you 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 know you have scattering data on nucleon nucleon, but as you get two particles closer and closer, you enter in the problem of a repulsive force. Okay, and this is not control. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the hardcore, and this is not control, and this is actually maybe what you know larger densities is also being seen. That was what I meant. You know, having the same framework, many body framework, like in, in this plot that I show you and having these different equations of state is different. Maybe I, I show it again. Um, no, it's, it's okay, Laura. It's, uh, yeah, okay. So I, I got this, the point. This is the problem. So it's the many body framework that gets more and more complicated and also the interaction itself, which at those densities, mm, it's also a problem you don't control. You, 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 you can constrain them because you have no data. This is exactly, this exactly. Is but uh, how to constrain this area? I don't know, to be honest. You, you get thank you, it. thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes, yes. Okay, good. 
So now I'm going to talk about hyperons, okay? Up to now, I have talked about the possibility of having neutrons, protons, and electrons in neutron stars. So I want to move to the strangeness part, okay? This is what I'm interested in all these lectures. And this is now the possibility of having hyperons in, in the neutron stars. So the why could we have hyperons? And it's the summary, you know, it's here. Due to the high value of the, of the density at the center of the star, okay, this I'm mentioning, as you go farther, farther, you know, inside the neutron star, you get larger densities. And the fact that the chemical potential of the nucleon is also increasing with density. So the, the, it could be that the small deep energy difference, let's put it like that, between the nucleons and the hyperons, which is the first uh, order is the mass, okay, it's overcome <clears throat> as because of the chemical potential of the uh, of the of the nucleon is increasing with density okay so it could happen that this energy difference okay somehow is not so important anymore because actually what what matters is how the chemical potential of these two particles you know compare to each other basically that's the idea okay so the chemical potential of the nucleons and the chemical potential of the lambdas which at first order would be the mass okay so how it compares uh, as we increase in density it could be at some point more favorable to have one or the other, but under the conditions of uh, neutron stars. Let's look it up into more detail. What I mean, and what I'm saying is that, you know, the first thing of course was to have nucleus, but already in the sixties, the, the idea was, you know, to go to think whether it is possible to have hyperons. Hyperons again is this, this list I'm showing you here. So as I was saying, you will have in the, the first approximation is to have a uh, uniform fluid of neutron rich nuclear matter in equilibrium with respect to weak interactions. So beta stable matter. So these are the reactions. And this is how it's understood in terms of the chemical potential of all these particles. But <clears throat> more exotic degrees of freedom might appear and again, this is why, because of the high value of density at the center and the rapid increase of the nucleon chemical potential with the density. So this gentleman actually found that it's possible maybe to, to have them at two or three times saturation density. How this is possible? What have you, which are the reactions that you have to see and think which is more favorable energetically than the other? So the idea, is that have beta stable matter, but with hyperonic degrees of freedom. So this is the traditional one that we are thinking, okay? Chemical potential of neutrons should be equal to the proton plus the electron, right? But if you have hyperons, I mean, you could think of reactions involving hyperons, then these kind of reactions would also be possible. The point is to know whether these reactions, for example, neutron, neutron going to proton and, and sigma minus, is energetically more favorable than this one at certain density, okay? This would be for elect, uh, sigma minuses. Here you can see that I'm putting two baryons at the end and, and at the beginning because the baryon number is conserved, right? Which is also equivalent to think of electrons, neutrons going to sigma minuses or uh, and the anti-electronic neutrino, okay? The electronic neutrino. So <clears throat> this reaction, will be understood in terms of the chemical potentials, okay? The chemical potential of the electron plus the, plus the neutron will give you the chemical potential of the sigma minus. The idea is sigma minus will appear if this relation is fulfilled, okay? Like mm, protons will appear if the difference between the chemical potential and the neutrons and the electrons gives you the chemical potential of the protons, okay? So the idea is, is this possible? This will be, for example, for sigma minuses, okay? For lambda, since it's not charged, you see that actually I don't need an electron chemical potential. So these kind of reactions are understood in terms of that the chemical potential of the neutron should be equal to the chemical potential of the lambda, okay? So these are reactions that are possible that you would think at the first, at first sight they are not so favored energetically as compared to this one. But it might happen that these relations here, because of the growth of the chemical potential of the neutron with density, it might happen, you know, that it's more beneficial to have sigma minuses or to have lambdas, okay? 
Of course, these are the reactions, these equilibrium with respect to weak interactions. Of course, we also have the charge neutrality. So again, now we also have to take into account that the whole thing has to be charge neutral. So the charge positively charged particles should be the quantity of them, you know, the, the charge, let's say, taking into account the charge and the density of those should be equal to the charge and, and, and the density of the, of the sum of the charge and the times the density of the other ones we have negative charge, okay? So here you have protons and sigma plus, and on the other side of the equation, electrons, muons, sigma minuses, and cascade minuses, okay? In this, you are seeing, I'm not considering omegas, I'm just thinking about the first hyperons in mass, okay? Lambdas, sigmas, and cascades. How do you understand these reactions? How, how do you see that, okay? How do you see whether it will be more favorable to have this reaction or these other ones here with the hyperons? So this is just by looking at, you know, how the chemical potentials evolve with density, okay? Now I'm reminding you what means when the sigma minuses appear or where the lambdas appear, okay? So let's think as a first order approximation that the chemical potential of the sigma is its mass and the chemical potential of the lambda is its mass, okay? So somehow we have here a number, okay? And then we see how this sum and this value here, so the chemical potential of the neutron plus the chemical potential of the electron evolves with density and how the chemical potential of the neutron evolves with density. And this is what you see here for a given model, okay? So the chemical potential of the neutron is changing with density, okay, in this way. And here is the sum, okay? So you can imagine that the sum goes faster than the chemical potential of one of the species alone, okay? And then you see that when you hit, okay, the value of the mass, that the chemical potential of the neutron is equal to the mass of the lambda in this case, then from then on, from that density on, lambdas will appear, okay? So that means that you have reached, you know, the possibility of having this reaction, and now lambdas start being populated in the star, okay? Because of the charge, you see that the sum of the chemical potential of the neutron plus the electron, you know, rises faster with density, and therefore it's easier to reach the chemical, pot I'm sorry, the mass of the sigma minuses in a lower density than in the case of the lambdas, okay? So you can see here that lambdas will appear at densities, lower densities than the lambdas. The sigmas will, minuses will appear before than the lambdas, okay? And this is funny because you would think, okay, the mass of the lambda is larger than the mass of the sigma, okay? Sorry, the mass of the lambda is smaller than the mass of the sigma. But due to these relations, okay, you can see because of the chemical potential of the electron, how it changes with the density, you see that this happens before. And this is the idea, okay? The idea is that, again, are these reactions more favored, are favored energetically than this one at certain density? Well, this will tell us how the chemicals potentials evolve with density, okay? And this is how we, what we see here. This is assuming that the mass of the sigma is the chemical potential of the sigma and the mass of the lambda is the chemical potential of the lambda. Of course, those are also obtained in your model. So you also know how the chemical potentials changes with density. So the idea is to do the same exercise, but using the chemical potential of both species, okay? And then you see that the densities vary, of course, a bit. But with these reactions is then how you find out the structure of your star, okay? So you start with a model, which you can extract the chemical potentials, and then you see, imposing these relations of beta equilibrium, you see which particles you have at each density or at each dense, at distance to the, to the center. And this is what you see here. This is the particle fraction versus the radial, the distance to the center, okay? As we move to lower values of the radius, it means we go towards the center of the star. So the idea is that your star actually has a radius of this, of 11 kilometers. This is assuming 11 kilometers. And then this is where hadrons appear. So you start having neutrons as the first particle. Yeah? You see that it's almost the particle fraction is one and it's going down. And the first thing that appear are protons and electrons, okay? So you have, as you can see, you're having not only neutrons, but already you have protons and electrons at very low, okay, densities. And you see that they are going together 
because of the charge neutrality. You have to have the same number of charged particles, positive and negative, okay? And at some certain point, they start diverging. And then it's because something, which is the muons, appear with a negative charge. So basically, you don't need so many electrons anymore because now you're being compensated by the muons, okay? And then the protons continue rising. And then suddenly, you know, there's a kink, really, in this baryonic uh, particle, in the proton, as sigma minuses appear, okay? So you start now because this reaction is possible, this relation is happening, then you start having sigma minuses. And then, well, later on, as you go towards larger densities, you start populating lambdas, okay? While the nucleons are being reduced and reduced, but still you see that, and it's usually happening in these models that the most uh, abundant particle is neutrons, okay? But this is obtained, as I'm telling you, by these conditions here, okay? By these conditions that is telling us when sigma minuses and lambdas will appear, or even cascades. In that model, cascades are not appearing yet, okay? So, and this is how actually you, 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 you determine your equation of state. So basically, you have a model that determines, you know, that gives you the energy density and gives you a freedom in an energy density that depends on the number of particles and then you, Let's say you assume a model with a certain, with some type of particles, nucleons, lambda, sigmas, whatever. Then you have your model, relativistic mean field, uh, Bruckner, Hartree-Fock, whatever. And then you 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 have a freedom depending on the number of particles. You will have some energy density, some pressure, okay. But now you put it into a neutron star. You put it into a neutron star, and then you have to fulfill these relations here. You have to fulfill beta stable relations. And therefore, is when you start fixing your quant the fractions of each of the particle in order to fulfill these relations, OK? And this is how you get now your composition of your neutron star. So with that, you get your final equation of state, OK? So where all these particles start appearing, you get your energy per particle or energy density. In this way, I'm, pre I'm showing the energy per particle versus the baryonic density, the particle density, or the pressure versus the particle density, okay? So here you have different lines, okay? So the red one is for a given model, okay? The energy per particle and the pressure, okay? You see, well, so I'm growing with density, the energy. Okay, fine, you're increasing the number of particles in your model, blah, 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 okay? But now what happens? Now you put hyperons, okay? You put these new species into the game and then you relate them with all these beta stable conditions. So these three lines have hyperons and you see the trend. This energy per particle is lowered, okay? So now you have less energy per particle at the same density. Or in pressure, this is translated that you have less pressure, okay? Why is that? I mean, this is called softening of the equation of state. So what is happening here is that you put a new particle in the system, okay? But you conserve the number of particles, okay? You change one nucleon by a hyper, by a hyper okay? By doing that, you remember that nucleons, okay, are fermions, okay? So you are filling up Fermi, you know, your different levels in the energy up to some certain density, Fermi level that gives you the total density, okay? But now the idea is one of these is change into a hyperon, okay? So a hyperon is a fermion, okay? And then it has its own Fermi C, okay? So somehow now you start populating new states of lower energy. So the energy is shared among more states, okay, as you change one nucleon into a hyperon. So therefore the whole thing, it's, it's lower in its energy, okay? It's lower in its pressure, okay? So in a few words, what I wrote here, oops, uh, uh, I, wrote, I went too fast. Because the softening is due to that adding one particle species and keeping the total number of particles fixed means opening a set of new available low energy states that can be filled. So you're still filling up some new Fermi levels or new ones, okay, in the lower ones. And therefore you are lowering the total energy of the system. So this is what is happening. In, when you have allowed or the hyperons appear, 
your energy per particle, your pressure of your system is gets smaller, it's lowered, okay? And this actually has important consequences for the mass and the radius because you have less pressure, okay? And if you have less pressure, you can imagine, as I was describing, you know, in the supernova, that the pressure compensates the pull of gravity, okay? So now if you're having less pressure, you will have, net, in order to be in equilibrium, you will have less pull of gravity. And this means less mass of, in the object. So you don't need such amount of mass to compensate the pressure, okay? So, and this means having objects with less mass, okay? And this is, and this is what I will now come to, which is called the hyperemphasis. So before that, again, you put a hyperon, so you're changing a nucleon by a hyperon, okay? You are adding one particle species, but keeping the, non the total number fixed. Then it means filling up new Fermi Cs from the bottom, so with lower energy. And this is lowering the total energy of the system. Before you had to put that particles in, in lower and higher, higher energy, uh, energy states. Now you don't need it anymore. You can put it in lower. So the energy of the system is lowered, okay? This is the main idea. And then this is what you see, this sun and drop. The different lines here are different um, interactions between the hyper and the nucleus. In the, in the first case, the blue one, maybe going back to the, this one, the blue one here had free hyperons. So there was no interaction between hyperons and nucleons, nothing. The green one was introducing this hyper and nucleon interaction, having some interactions among the particles, okay, the hyperons and nucleons. And the uh, violet one, or yeah, violet, well, uh, it means interacting also hyper and hyper, okay? This is a given model, but in all cases, this is a feature, okay? This is physics. This is happening in any of the models, okay? And because of this physical reason that you have a new particle, you have new uh, states uh, filling out, which are lower in energy, you're lowering the, then the whole total energy of the system is being lowered, okay? Okay. Excuse so, me, Alan. Yes. Alan, so, yes. I mean, you very clearly stated that uh, this softening is model independent, and it yes. is uh, it, it's clear. It is a statistical fact, basically. Yes. Yes. But uh, anyway, what kind of dynamics uh, is included in that model that you've shown? What kind uh, of dynamic interaction? Well, here it was. I think it was an, uh, in that one. I think it was this APSA. This one, this interaction for a hyperon nucleon. It was a meson exchange model. I mentioned, I mean, Ignacio wants to raise the hands. He probably, I mean, he has these calculations. I don't know if you want to ask, answer, Ignacio. No, the, the point is that uh, this softening, this is my opinion, but I think it's not true that is not model, uh, is not model independent. Because, for example, here in the calculation by Isaac Bidania yes. that you, you are showing, Yes. There is no three body interaction between nucleons and uh, lambdas. And uh, if you include this interaction, as we have shown in a paper with Isaac and Domenico. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. But okay, then you're putting a new ingredient, the three body interaction. Okay. So I'm just saying if you have the same, I mean, I mean, there will be a softening, but then if you in, include another- Maximum masses above two solar masses. Yes, then you get two solar masses. That's true, that's true. So, so it's, let's say it's model dependent. I mean, but you-, you I agree. don't know if you, are, if you agree. This is my-, my Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't fully agree because I'm just thinking, you know, in the same conditions, okay? I don't, I have two body, okay? Interaction and I put a hyperon, okay? Then the whole thing softens. Now, if you start putting three body interactions, you somehow you're changing the, 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 the situation. Now you're putting three body, but did you put three body in the nucleon as well? I guess so. It's the same. I don't know. I'm just, uh, I mean, this idea of, I think it's quite model independent. I mean, we can discuss it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Go ahead, sorry. No, that's no, okay. Uh, yeah, you were asking me exactly the details of this calculation. I mean, this is, I think, a Bruckner-Hartree-Fock because it's Isaac and, and Arturo and Angels. 
Uh, and then they were using hyperonuclear, I mean, free hyperons, not interacting, so just a free case. But when they put the interaction on hyperonuclear, then they, they use, I think, Nymegans, of course. So one boson exchange model. It's, it's fine, it's fine. It's so anyway. <laughs> very good, very good. Go okay, ahead. go on. Yeah, so. So yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, now I'm going now to the mass and the radius. Um, so now in order, you know, you have your equation of state, you have an energy per particle, okay? Now, what I'm mentioning now, what, what's the, the situation in the neutron star? How you get the mass, how you get the radius? So basically you have to solve the structure equations for neutron stars, okay? So the idea, you know, you can just think as a Newtonian formulation. So basically pressure compensated uh, the, 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 the force of the gravity, okay? So this is why here, this is, you know, in a, in a small volume here, okay, you have the attraction given by the gravity. And this is compensated by the difference of pressure in this exerted in this volume, which is this one here, which is given by the pressure by your equation by the pressure of the by the um, by the the um, what you have inside. Okay, and this is equal to mass and acceleration. Okay, now if you divide by the area and the radius. Okay. Uh, then you, you get, you know, like uh, I'm dividing by the air. I mean, this is the pressure times the, um, the area. Then I'm, I'm getting, uh, again, this part of the gravity. And then you have this derivative of pressure with respect to the radial. So I'm thinking of a, something a spherical uh, symmetric. And then if it's in other static equilibrium, it means that the uh, acceleration is zero. I mean, you're talking about that these two compensate each other, okay? So at the end, you get these two relations. Actually, I, I'm showing you this first one. So the variation in pressure with the distance to the center is given you know, by the mass that is included at that distance, okay? By the matter density, this is matter density, okay? You raise the hand, Ignacio, again? No. Okay, because I had this. No, Laura. Oh, oh, oh. No, no. Sorry. Okay, okay. Should be. Uh, I, I should. Uh, yeah, no, I, I had like it, suddenly it, yeah, yeah. your hand. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And divided by the, the distance, okay, the squared. So basically, this is Newton law, okay? And then this one is just to compute, of course, is correlated the mass uh, at a certain radius, okay, which is correlated with this matter density. How do you solve that? Okay, you solve that like differential equations, a couple equations. So basically what you do is you have to assume something at the center. So you assume a central pressure at the, at the center of the radius, which is given here. You hit some initial conditions, okay? And then also you know that the mass in the center is zero. Okay, well, this is the, or usually the calculations are done to a, a little step, okay? But at the center is zero. Okay, and the idea is to integrate these equations until you reach the surface, okay? Until your radius, until your pressure is zero, okay? So you start with a given pressure and you integrate until uh, the pressure is zero. And once the pressure is zero, this gives you the total mass of the object and the radius of the object. So this is the condition, the important condition. You assume some central density and then you, as you integrate out the star until the surface, you get uh, zero pressure, okay? This is Newtonian formulation. Of course, these are compact objects. So the thing is a bit more complicated uh, because we are talking about objects of one to two solar masses and radius of 10 to 20 kilometers. Uh, so general relativistic effects become important. And actually the way to go here is through the Einstein field equation. So where you have your, your tensor, okay, uh, uh, the G mu nu, I mean, the, which is the, the, the Einstein tensor, and it's correlated with the energy density tensor. There's where the equation of state appears, okay? So actually, if you start from here and do spherical, non -sym uh, spherical symmetric stars, which are non-rotating, you can solve, okay, this, 
and find what they are called the tolman oppenheimer folk of equations okay so assuming you're basically assuming some metric which is spherical symmetric in non-rotating and actually if you compare these with the previous ones you see basically that this if you forget about these three terms in parentheses this is the newtonian and uh, solution and these three terms are giving you the corrections okay to to the general relativity corrections to the this hydrostatic equilibrium okay uh, of course here you are already correlating the matter density with the energy density okay uh, so basically the idea is to solve a very similar equation a bit more complex mathematically okay but with the same ideas you start with a central pressure you know that the mass at this point is zero and then you integrate until the pressure is zero and then gives you the radius and of course if you know the radius you know the mass of the object at this radius okay so this is how we how it is done so basically the ingredient here is the equation of state so which there are other constraints as well that has to be taken care of i mean you have to take them into account not care of so there are by general relativity arguments that we have that neutron stars are not black holes in the sense that the maximum, for example, the escape velocity, okay, should maximum is the speed of light. It gives you constraints on the mass and the radius. So there are some limits that will make this star collapse. This is actually this general relativity argument is this Schwarzschild limit, okay. Otherwise the whole star collapses. And this gives you a correlation between the radius and the mass, okay? Also, there is the compressibility or stability of matter that the pressure versus energy density should be positive. So it also gives you a relation between the radius and the mass that has to be fulfilled in order to have some stable star, realistic star, okay? There's also the causality constraint that the speed of sound should be smaller or maximum should be the speed of light. So this will be theoretical constraints on, so it gives you some limits, okay, on the radius and mass and relations. There is also a more experimental, I mean, in the sense that you use data, experimental data or observational data, better to say, that you have rotation that, you know, uh, tells you that the centrifugal force cannot exceed the gravitational force. Otherwise, this star will disrupt. And this is the Kepler limit. And the idea is that if you know, calculate this Kepler limit, tells you that the frequencies of rotation have to be smaller. And of course, now you can use arguments, you know, of which kind of uh, frequencies are we talking experimentally in order to set up these limits, okay? So, this is for limits, okay, that, that you have to consider, but also now here is the recipe, okay, that what we do, okay, with the equation of state in order to get the masses and the radius. So we have our model, okay, we have our energy per density as a function of different fractions and the total variant density, but this is not constrained, okay, so you have a total variant density, you, have, you can have different baryon par particles with different baryon densities, okay. With this model, you can compute chemical potentials, okay? You can do derivatives, and then you can find the chemical potential of each of the species. And now you put it into a star, and then you know beta equilibrium and charge neutrality. So then you get the relation between the chemical potentials and the, and the charge and fractions. And therefore, you have fixed now your composition and your equation of state, because now you know how the fractions are correlated with the density, because there are these relations here. And of course, now you know the pressure. So with this, now you go and calculate, the, use the structure equations and calculate, okay? And then solve those equations of state. What do you do as a central pressure? This is some number that you, you know, this is your freedom of election in the sense that usually you have a pressure versus energy density. I show you this pressure or energy per particle versus the particle fraction, right? And different values. So basically what we do is to run along this curve. So different pressures, initial pressures are used in this different pressure versus energy. And for each of these points, we do the integral. We do, we, sorry, we integrate those equations, okay? So the idea is just you start with some value of pressure energy density and you integrate out okay and you solve this then you start with another one and you integrate 
okay? And in this sense, now you get masses and radius that are given by your model. So this is how you, what you get. This is now the plot I was showing you before. Mass and radius. So take one curve, I don't care. I mean, uh, AP4, okay? This is Akmal Pandari Pan, 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 I think it's Akmal Pandari Pan the Ravenhal number four. So there are some changes in the parameters. So this curve here is solution of these TOVs, this Tolman Oppenheim of Volkov equations for different pressures, okay? Running along this equation of state, this AP4. So all of these are solutions, okay? For different central pressures. So you get a set of masses and radius that your model gives, okay? So here in this case, you get up to what? 2.2 uh, so, uh, solar masses and radius of 10 kilometers. Uh, but you also get masses of 1.4 with radius of 11.5, okay? This is that one which is lying in the center of everything, okay? Now you have other, I think these are also relativistic mean film, these are relativistic mean film models, I think. And you can see, you know, radius which are larger and even larger masses, okay? And these ones, the green ones are basically quark matter. I'm, I haven't talked about them, okay? But these are nucleonic models, okay? And just to show you, all these bands here are forbidden, okay? Those here down here for, because of rotation and those here because of all these causality general relativity arguments that told you a relation between the radius and the mass, okay? So basically the allowed region is here. So we expect that all our observations are somewhere here. And what we actually want is not only a mass, but a radius, okay? So we have these two solar mass here, but we want a radius of these objects, okay? Because then if the radius is here and none of these models is going through, then we have, you know, an issue. So maybe there's no nucleons. Maybe those models have, can be improved. I mean, there is, you know, uh, something to be understood, okay? So, because as you can see in this case, there are several models with nucleonic degrees of freedom. I believe all of them are nucleonic. There are no hyperons, but, they have different uh, interactions between the particles, and this is giving you this difference in mass and radius, okay? So, and uh, these are just to show you these two important measurements of two solar mass observations. This is from 2010, the modest. Then this is from 2013, Antoniadis, okay, and collaborators. And what happening with the hyperons, okay? And this is the discussion we had with, with Ignacio the softening of the equation of state and uh, the fact that we have somehow, uh, if we have this softening, which then leads for most of the models, okay? When we put the hyperons in the same model, when we put hyperons, it goes down, okay? It goes down the energy per particle, the pressure. So this means that the mass, maximum mass is also lower because gravity, I mean, basically you, you have less pressure, so you need less pull of gravity. You just need less mass, okay? And this is the hyperon puzzle. This is the, the famous hyperon puzzle in the sense that, um, eh, sorry, um, if we have any, any softening of the equation of state because a hyperon appear, and then we have lower masses. So we assume we have hyperons, okay? We, we, we think we have hyperons, okay? Because energetically it's probable to have them. So now if we have them, you will have an in softening. So, but how we solve this? Uh, because there are observations of two solar masses, okay? So this is before going to that and giving you maybe some solutions and actually Ignacio was mentioning uh, one way to go to show you again what we have from data uh, and, uh, and for data scattering of data on hypernuclei. And the different models that people have been doing over the years, okay, and different way, I mean, different types of, there are more eh, authors in each of them, but just to show you that people have been really working on hyperons, okay, in, in neutron stars. And here is several solutions, okay, of the, of the, of, of how to go, okay? Basically, all of them try to stif stiffen the question of state. The idea is to stiffen the question of state. And by doing that is maybe trying to, pull the hyperons to larger densities, not to appear too early, 
but also, you know, uh, so have an equation of state that is not too stiff, because if it's too stiff, it means the chemical potential of the nucleons will go fast with density and then hyperons will appear fast. So it has to be stiff enough to have two solar masses, but not too stiff so hyperons don't appear too fast, okay? So different ways to go is to play a bit, you know, on stiffening the interaction in such a way that you get higher masses. And this is, for example, what has been done in relativistic film models. This is an example, you know, in the relativistic mean film models to, 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 to push, to shift the appearance of hyperons to later states, okay? So the softening is not happening. Or there's something in the chat somebody's asking or? No? There is a suggestion uh, on the chat uh, of, the, yeah, yeah, of the, the paper. The... Ah, okay. Yes, yes, because uh, I think this, uh, this is an important result that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, be... yeah, I wanted to mention it here now, you know, hyperonic free body oh, okay, process. Thank you. So there was uh, my conclusion, at least reading, it was there was not general consensus because some mothers are with this hyperonic free bodies reaching these two solar masses, others maybe not, like you, you mentioned, we show Isaac. There was also quantum Monte Carlo, you know, including these uh, three body forces, this lambda nucleon. And then, as you said, I mean, and this is what I meant here, you know, this hyperonic three body forces and chiral FTs whether it's solving this, okay, by pushing, you know, this, this mass to two solar masses, okay? And this is, in the, I think, in the direction of your paper, right, Ignacio? Yes, yes, Laura. But the, the point is that uh, if the, there is repulsion mm -hmm. already among uh, nucleons, yes. strong repulsion at high density, it, it could be that it is not energetically convenient to form hyperons. That is a, uh, that idea that is always convenient to form hyperons uh, is based on uh, Fermi gas arguments. Yes. And so interactions, repulsive interaction can change this uh, conclusion. Exactly. No, no, this I agree my... with you. So okay. I agree with you. So I agree mm -hmm. with you that uh, this way of approaching is like, making hyperons not uh, their appearance very late or not appearing. Oh, okay, okay, Laura, sorry. Go, go ahead with your thought. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I mean, we have an expert in the audience, so he can criticize everything I say. That's good. So, and also, you know, um, there's also works working on, on, on pushing this hyperon appearance because of appearance of other um, particles like condensates or delta isobars, so delta particles, okay? Really pushing the hyperons to later states, avoiding this softening, okay? Uh, so people working on delta um, um, part, isobars or condensates, okay? And of course, we might even forget about uh, having, you know, happening hyperons because maybe quark matter could start appear before, okay? We don't, because we don't know. I mean, and then the idea is, you know, before a hyperons appear, quark matter might appear. And then you have a phase transition. So it's a different phase, okay? And therefore the idea would be, you have a early phase transition to quark matter before hyperons appear. And then this quark matter has enough repulsive character in order to give you two solar mass, which is also another issue, okay? So, uh, yeah, this would be more, let's say, uh, not classical, but uh, different ways of approaching, you know, with the, our degrees of freedom with hyperons or with quark matter. But of course, now people are also discussing, you know, maybe dark matter will help, you know, like gravitationally interacting with, with, with nucleons and then helping, you know, to, 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 to have hyperons and dark matter mixed. Uh, maybe also your theory, you know, I'm solving the TOVs, I'm doing a spherical symmetric in, you know, assuming uh, some metric, okay, maybe this is uh, something different, you know, the metric is modifying, this is our the modified gravity theories, which then will give you some modified TOVs, and then you might even have hyperons and you get two solar masses because your lying theory was not actually fully correct. 
So, I mean, there are different approaches, okay, to, 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 to that issue. And actually, I'm finishing now. So basically, I think the way, you know, to, to go is to, to get more observation of mass radios. I keep on saying that. And this is, you know, these blobs here that people are trying to, to, to obtain from observationally. And this is um, coming, this plot, you know, it's like um, a wishful thinking or what we would like to for some uh, stars that we know the mass to get the radius, okay, through these new space missions. This is actually for the XTP. Uh, but also I said, NICER is already running and, and, and having, you know, getting at least two results that I know of. So, and uh, of course, I mean, also gravitational waves. We shouldn't forget that also it's a source for information, okay, on these tidal deformabilities and on the mass and the radius. So, and uh, actually with that, uh, I'm just showing you some bibliography that this talk is based on, okay? So basically there are some books that people starting in the field, you know, should know about and should at least read a bit. And then, yeah, also the reference and papers that are mentioned in the, in the, in the lecture. So thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Very nice, very interesting, of course. Fashionable subject, service. Questions? If any. Yeah, <laughs> any I have another question. Please. So, uh, since at the end you solved the equations uh, numerically, which is you cr the criterion you use to define the range of your neutron star? How can you? Decide that you reach the convergence to the final mass at uh, 12 kilometer or 12.1 kilometer. Well, I don't decide. Okay, my model decides for me. Okay, so so what I want to say is that you have your pressure as a function of the density. You have your composition. Okay, this is your model now that is in 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 the conditions of neutron star. And now what I'm saying is that I I start with some central density. Okay, and now I integrate. Okay, those equations and those equations depend on uh, those structure equations depend on your equation of state. Maybe I could share again. Yeah, share the. Yes, the maybe what I'm, yeah. what I'm saying here. Uh, maybe here. You see here, okay, those are these equations, okay, and it depends on the pressure and energy density. Here you have the pressure, here you have also the energy density, here, okay. So basically, you start with some central value. And now, you compute, you calculate the next step, okay? And then in the next step, you, you need to know the energy density and pressure at this step, okay? And this is given by your model, okay? And then you integrate again, okay? I mean, you are doing step by step. And how, when do you stop? When your pressure is zero or maybe the iron uh, pressure, okay? So you, you really stop your integration when you are at the surface. and. and your condition is pressure zero. And when you get that, you stop. And in there, you know what's my radius. And then I know what's the quantity of mass that you have up to that radius. This is how you, you get your, your star and how you get the profile also of the star. Okay. How is the energy? The density is a function of the radius changing. Okay. So what I'm saying, I decide, I decide when pressure is equal zero, but then my model enters here. And this will determine if it's faster or, you know, when do I stop, okay? This was your question? Yes, uh, yes, it was uh, from a very pra very practical point of view because uh, in any case, you, you will have a numerical uh, uh, discretization. So, I mean, you can decide that uh, it is a zero when it is yeah, uh, 10 okay. to when the it's, when it's exactly so, zero. I mean, maybe this may, okay. can make a difference on the radius that you will uh, And not so here. much. I mean, the, to be honest, when you integrate, sometimes you go to negative pressures and then you interpolate, okay? And then you make an interpolation. Or some people, as I said, finishes in the pressure of the iron, okay? And this is your last point. It doesn't make a difference of one kilometer, okay? It doesn't <laughs> make. It changes maybe the... The second digit after the point. I don't know the centes. Okay, okay, it doesn't may, change. May, may, may I add a comment on this, yeah, uh, Sergio? Yeah. Sergio, may I add a comment? Yes, Ignacio, go, go ahead. Of course, uh, of course. I mean, uh, yes, no, yes. Usually, as Laura said, one take uh, 
uh, let's say, not exactly zero, but the pressure that correspond to iron, because uh, iron is the, the, the element in the, in the outer, at, at the surface. So, and uh, one has, should be very careful in choosing the grid for the integration point. This is not, uh, let's say, equal space. When you approach the surface, you have, uh, you, uh, you choose, with some trick, you choose a lot, a lot of points. So you can determine the, the surface. But my comment is on this slide by Hans Josef Schultz, yes. it's misleading because the surface is not the radial. The, the value of the radial coordinate where r small r is equal to r, capital R, the radius of the star. The, the surface is defined as a surface radius. Okay. The surface is the point where you have a four pi square, four pi r squared, because space time is curved. So the distance okay. from the center of to the surface of the star, so the radial coordinate, yes. is not r, is larger than r because okay. the uh, space time okay. is curved inside the, the, okay. the star. Okay. No, this was my fault. This is not Joseph. No, no, I this is it. about YouTube by Hans Joseph. Yeah, <laughs> but it's not, it, no, but it, it is misleading. I, I, put, I put that myself, okay? So it's maybe, misleading. Yeah. I'm not saying that it's uh, wrong, it's misleading. I want to say uh, that before I said that uh, this is a very fashionable subject, I wanted to say a, a very fascinating subject, which is, <laughs> which is different, you know. But if, if I can add another thing, uh, I mean, it is this very famous uh, profile that you've shown now for the, the solutions of the TOV equations. Yes. I mean, in, in several cases, they allow more than one mass for a given radius, no? Uh, is that the problem? Is that uh, how would you mean? For example, this? this is quark matter. Yeah, yeah, for quark matter, but also some other uh, problems. Yeah, some others that matter. curve. If it curves too much to the right and then it comes back, yeah, that's right. So yeah, for example, this one, right? This yeah, one will will give you two solutions. Yes. Two or three, but. <laughs> oh, well, okay, yeah. It depends on where you. If you are lying here, maybe you get really two or three solutions. Yeah. Is that the problem? Is that um, I mean, uh, normal? Is that? Uh... It it could happen if it's really flat. Okay, it doesn't mean. Will it mean that several masses start have the same radius? Okay, which. Oh. I don't know. Oh, okay, okay, uh, just take a look. No, no, there is no problem, Sergio. That okay. is an uh, effect of general relativity, uh, balance between general relativity and the behavior of the equation of state. So it's, uh, it's uh, let's say, it can, can be explained. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Yes. Good. Other comments by the audience, uh, questions? Uh, maybe the one, one possible question is the is the, related to the fact that the the mass radius relation that you would get from uh, for quark stars is really really different from yes. the other. So maybe it's possible to guess some possible signature that uh, you should look for in the astrophysical data. Well, you know, there was this excitement, I remember, when the radios, you know, like uh, if we got very, very small radios, we are having problems with the nucleonic equations of state, okay? Because, I mean, this is another example. These are two equations of a state quark matter, and these are the radios, okay? I'm sorry, and these are nucleonic models. Those are hybrid. This is another story, okay? But okay. Uh, so the, you could see, you know, that you were having very small radios and small masses. Uh, which you don't have in those ones. So this was saying, okay, maybe this is a signature of a quark matter, okay, inside. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, also at some point masses of this, uh, when you have a quark matter, now you see here examples that they have two solar masses, but in my previous slide, I have these ones models, SQM1 and SQM3, and you could see that this one was not even, no, was not reaching the two solar mass, okay? So also people are saying, okay, we're getting into trouble to get this two solar mass observation with only quark matter and a surface, okay? Usually they have like a, a dronic surface and inside quark matter, okay? So these were signatures that people were discussing, but you know, now NICER gives you radius 
around here. So, I don't know. I mean, even not these models, okay? This SQM3, no, but in my later one, I'm having solutions of quark matter and the radius are here, okay? So, let's say we were very excited to have a radius and the mass, we are still, but if we don't have it in the extreme cases of very large radius or very small radius, then it's, start, it's starting getting difficult again to discern which model, you know, whether it's nucleonic, whether it's adronic, whether it's uh, quark matter. So we need something else, of course, not only mass and radius, but uh, with this only, I mean, now that we are sitting here, you know, it's like, okay, now we, we, we can still have everything in here, right? I don't know. So, but anyway, in any case, it's very important, okay? Because at least we have something and we will have not only one, but different ones. So we will can know where the equation of state. Of course, this will also depend on the error on these observations, okay? So, because if we have one kilometer, then you start having too much possibilities. You have less than, you know, like the masses. But okay, this is also, you know. Okay. Comments, other questions, comments? If I can comment about yes. uh, the, the, the question yes. raised by Andrea. Uh, about the, the, the different shape of the mass radius relation of bare strange star. This is a consequence to, due to the fact that these objects are self-bound objects. So even if you turn off uh, gravity, these objects are bound by the strong interaction. So their mass increase for low value of the mass as the third power of the radius. Yes. Okay, so this is the, the main reason of the qualitative uh, difference between the mass radius relation of, uh, let's call, uh, normal neutron stars and uh, uh, strange stars. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. More questions? Okay, uh, if not, uh, let's thank uh, Laura again. And uh, I would uh, close the session for everybody and wish each other, Laura, again, when you want, but uh, your, your next lecture is, uh, is on uh, Thursday. Yes.